بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Welcome to everyone and all those who are watching on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. May Allah bless you all. Tonight, inshallah ta'ala, um, I want to take some fawaid uh, from one of my publications, Monthly Q&A Book 2. Uh, of course, let me remind you of the upcoming uh, monthly workshop. And this month, uh, we have the fifth of abortion. Can you guys hear me? Is audio good? No audio? Audio is off. Can you hear me now? You can hear me? It's good now? You sure? Okay, alright. I don't know what's up with YouTube lately. But maybe it's something that I'm doing wrong. <clears throat> Um, inshallah ta'ala, the last Thursday of every month, which I believe is the 28th in this month, Bidni Allah ta'ala, will be on the fiqh of abortion, the rulings that pertain to abortion, when, uh, if and when a Muslim woman can get an abortion, if and when a Muslim man can allow his wife to get an abortion, uh, if and when a Muslim woman has a child before marriage, is it best to keep the child to abort the child uh, if a woman is violated unfortunately uh, if the woman is very sick or the child is sick things like this that pop up in real life situations that can happen in which a Muslim may need to or want to or think of getting an abortion طيب. so that's going to be 9.30pm um, Eastern Time you can sign up for that at our website hadithdiscipleshop.com our Facebook page Mufti Ibn Munir our Instagram as well, inshallah ta'ala. Hopefully the sound is good now. It's good or not, guys. Just one last check. Keep keep peace, inshallah. No, that's the 28th. We do it the last Thursday of every month at 9.30. Audio is good. All right, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Also, for those who weren't around, uh, obviously before the live stream days, for the hadith and seeking knowledge by anyone, uh, and this uh, successor for the Hadith and Seeking Knowledge Volume 2. Make sure you check out these uh, beneficial publications, Ibn al Ta'ala. You can find them on our sites. Uh, I believe they're available on Amazon as well, along with most of our other publications, Ibn al Ta'ala. Make sure that you complete your series, Volume 1 and Volume 2, and look forward to uh, any upcoming publications as well. Tonight is going to be on. Book two of Mufti Q and A, and of course this book one of Mufti Q and A. Tonight we're going to read from page number sixty-two. And it's a very important issue, a very common issue. Many people misunderstand, misinterpret, and they may suffer from on a daily basis, especially being in the workplace, or especially entering the masjid and not praying in your shoes. And things like this, which most masjids people don't were not allowed to, to pray in their shoes. So, question uh, number 32 it says, praying in rolled up pants, tucked up clothes, and tied hair. When you offer the salah in your house, at the masjid, the musallah, or the airport, and the parking lot, wherever you are, what is the ruling on the following three things? Number one, Rolled up pants. I want to roll my pants up. And of course, um, one may say that most of the Muslims today practice isbah. For one reason or another. Those Muslims, the majority who don't believe that it's haram. Or who don't feel that it's haram. Or don't know that it's haram. They follow the view of the scholars who say that it's okay for a man, not a woman, to have his pants or his thobe beneath the ankles. They follow that view. Whether they follow that view or not, most Muslims practice the act. The act is their 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 izars, their pants, their thiyab is is musb, is, is bad. Okay? Or those who do know but choose to do otherwise, 
or those who don't know, they've never even heard of Isbal. They don't even have an idea or clue that that's an Islamic ruling. But one thing that we can conclude with certainty is that the average man today from among the Muslims, his pants, his tobe, his izar, is going to be beneath the ankles. That's a fact, all right? So therefore, what many Muslims do today, whether you're black Muslim or white Muslim, Puerto Rican or Dominican Muslim, whether you come from Palestine, Syria, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Iraq, Kurdistan, uh, many Muslims, you'll see them, they'll you come from Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, they come into the masjid, and you'll see the first thing that they'll do is they'll roll up their pants. Whether you're a Yemeni Muslim from Brooklyn, okay, you come into the masjid and you roll your pants up. You're wearing baggy trousers, jeans, pants, you roll up the, roll the pants up, all right? What's the ruling on that? Do you have to do that? Is that a good thing to do? Is it dislike to pray with your pants under your ankles? Or unfortunately, with some Muslims, you'll find their pants is under their feet, literally. They'll walk on the carpet and their pants are dragging under their feet. And of course, it's even more paradoxical when Muslims take off their shoes and they make a huge, big, gigantic fuss about shoes. Shoes are evil. Shoes have no place in the law's home, in the mosque. Take off your shoes, you're going to beat you with a bat, a stick, or a club. Shoes are dirty and filthy. But their pants are dragging on the dirt and the mud. The pants are in the rain, water. The, the pants are in the slush, the mush, the mush, the, the melting snow with the dirty asphalt. When they use the hammam, they take off their shoes. Oftentimes, they have their, their pants will be under their feet in the wudu station. When they urinate, their pants, etc. This is a problem. So do you have to roll up your pants? Should you roll up your pants? Secondly is tuck, tuck clothes. If uh, you have a style in which your sleeves are up a little bit, or some brothers, they'll have it, you know, tucked up like this, for an example, right? Um, or it's the style to have your pants tucked up or hemmed up or cuffed up. Many brothers have skinny pants, skinny jeans, uh, and they have it cuffed at the bottom, whatever trend or fad that you're following. Or other types of garment, like this. This is not... You see this, guys? T hypothetically speaking, when I pray like this, my hat, which is a part of my clothes, my garments, my thiab, my malabis, it's technically what? It's tucked. Agree or not? It's, it's, it's tucked, right? And the other things that I'm wearing, a shirt, a pocket, a pleat, whatever, that's tucked. That's hemmed. My pants that are cut not practicing this battle, they're hemmed, right? This is very, very a delicate issue now. Last but not least, tied up hair. Do I have to let my hair go? Does my hair have to touch the ground? I got dreads in my hair. Whether I'm a Rastafar or not. Ex-Rastafar, Rastafarian, just like the style. Corn dreads, box braids, whatever. A woman or a man, corn rolls. You have a plait. You have a ponytail. You come from Spain or Portugal, or you're Italian Muslim, or whatever your nationality or ethnicity is, and you have a ponytail. It's tied up as a man. Is that permissible? Women who have plaits and braids, etc. Can your hair be tied up? Or you have your hair tied up and we call it a, a bun, or a hair turban thingy, whatever. Is that permissible? So this is a very practical issue for man and woman. Man and woman, man, woman, and child. All right? And many people, if not most people, they don't have the proper understanding of this issue. So, uh, it states here. Assalamu alaikum. My ready hadith in Sahih Muslim saying, don't pray with tucked up garments or something like that. I was told that it's referring to having pants rolled up, etc. Is this true or can you explain the hadith? That's the question from the anonymous questioner. I said, the author, may Allah hide his faults. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Perhaps you are talking about the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas in Bukhari and Muslim where the Prophet was quoted to have said Umirtu an asjuda ala sab'ati a'zumin wala akuffa thawba wala sha'ra I've been ordered and commanded to pray upon seven parts of my body or the literal translation upon seven a'zum i.e. seven bones and I've also been ordered to refrain from tucking, tying, 
rolling any clothes and any hair. So, in this authentic hadith, the Prophet ﷺ clearly says that he was commanded to do something and commanded not to do something. As far as what he is commanded to do, he is commanded to make sujood. His face, his forehead, his nose, his knees, his feet, etc. Make sujood in the perfect and complete manner. So that's what the Prophet has been commanded, to make sujood upon seven parts of his body. No issue with regards to that. As far as al kaf Okay, not to tie up, not to roll up. In other words, when I make sujood, make sujood in a natural manner, a natural and organic way. Whatever is loose from my clothes should fall down, and whatever is loose from my hair should fall down. And another understanding of this is that whatever is tied up or fastened before the salah can also remain like that in the salah as it is the vahir, that which is apparent from the madhab of Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah. As it is explained by Hafid bin Hajj al Asqalani and many other ulama of the past, they have that view as well. Meaning that you don't have to untuck or unfold things. However, you hear is before you pray, that's how you pray. And you're not to intentionally tuck up or roll up your clothes and your hair for the prayer. You're to avoid that. But one understanding is that which is already the way it is should remain. Tucked, tied, twisted, leave it as it is. And don't say, I don't want my clothes to touch the ground. I don't want my hair to touch the ground, etc. Alright? So many great scholars, Ibn Rajab and Fatih al Bari, that's not mentioned here, it's a side fighter. He explains this at length. At length. And Ibn Hajj, rahimahullah, as well as we have quoted. From the modern day ulama, we started with the old ulama first. Then we work up to the modern day ulama, Sheikh Muhammad bin Saleh al Uthameen, rahimahullah is that the prohibition of not tying up and rolling up and tucking garments and hair is for those who do not or who do it with the intention of praying like that. My hair is loose. I will tie it up so my hair will not be on the floor. My clothes are like this. I'm going to roll them up. I'm not going to tuck I'm going to tuck them up. So when I make sujood, they don't fall loosely and naturally. And many ulama, if not most of the other fuqaha, say that uh, that it is general. And that it is a prohibition doing it before the prayer and nothing to do with the salah, also doing it for salah, that's their view. So different understandings of the hadith. Some say is that you don't have to worry about tucking up or rolling or whatever. Others say whatever is left or whatever was before the prayer should remain in the prayer. And some say let it flow. Nothing should be tied up, tucked up, or hemmed up. And if that was the case, and that was the, the, the strongest view of that hadith, understanding of the hadith, it would be a great hardship. And there'll be many, many things that we wear on a daily basis we would not be allowed to wear. And of course, the Prophet ﷺ did not necessarily wear pants. They didn't wear thobes or shawar kameesis. They had an izar. They had a rida. Their clothing was different. A jubba, so on and so forth. It wasn't like how we have different layers and stitching. It's, it's very, very different. Let alone hairstyles of women. Okay? Moving forward. Another branch is that, is this considered to be haram or dislike? So, root number one is, does the prohibition pertain to those who do it specifically for the prayer? Or is it general? And we have stated, is that the correct view, is that that prohibition is pertaining to those who do it specifically for the prayer. I don't want my hair or my clothes to be on the ground. Whether it's based off of pride, or whatever the reason. And if that's your natural hairstyle, your natural clothing style, then it's la bas, no problem. That's the view that we have selected to be a qawl rajih from the statements of the ulama of past and of present. Moving forward, another branch, far akhar, um, is that regardless whether it's before the salat, during the salat, women, men, tucked, hemmed, is it haram or is it dislike? Is it haram or is it makruh? It says here, many of them, if not most of them, most of the scholars say it is tanzi, disliked i.e. do not do it and not necessarily haram. So most of the ulama say that it's not uh, impermissible, even if you did do it for the salah. And then some of them say it's haram, regardless of with the reason behind that. Moving forward, what is important is that the view that we see to be the most fit, and Allah knows best, is that it is pertaining to doing it for the prayer. And that's because the people of knowledge, they say the wisdom behind it is being prohibited, or the wisdom behind it being prohibited is that it's a type of tekebbur, 
It's a type of pride and arrogance for a person not letting everything to fall down and prostrate like what he's doing. But that doesn't apply if that's how you dress before Salah. You're not doing it out of pride and arrogance. That's how you dress. That's your style, as Sheikh Uthameen has explained. Let alone other concepts that are clearly permissible and not disliked, such as a woman whose hair is tied up, a woman whose hair is in plaits or braids, a man's hair that is tied up or in plaits or braids, as we have explained, is permissible. So there are other evidences and proofs that show us, and Allah knows best what is desired meaning. So we look at the hadith individually, we look at the fiqh ruling individually, and we look at the other hadiths and other fiqh rulings collectively. What is the ruling on plaiting hair, tying hair? So if that hadith was absolute, if that was meant, then that would mean a woman can never ever pray with her hair tied up. And there's so many hadiths in which women prayed, plaited and braided their hair. They asked about ghusl, from menstruation, from uh, janaba, and he never ever said, keep the braids in unless you're going to make salah. Everybody clear on this? Let alone hadiths about men wearing braids and things like this. Moving forward. Secondly, the hadith about letting your hair make sujood with you. What about those who don't have long hair? I have a low haircut. Whether you're from New York, you call it a Caesar. Whether you call it a hustler from Philly, dark hustler, light hustler. I don't have long hair. So how can I let my hair prostrate with me? My beard isn't long. How's my beard prostrate with me? A woman has a short haircut. A woman has braids or whatever, twists or ties. Her hair doesn't grow long. How does she make her hair prostrate with her? So that, that's not practical to every Muslim. Every Muslim doesn't have long hair. And every person who wears long hair doesn't wear it in long style. All right? And these are all from what we call qara'inu tarjih, context clues that lead us to the correct and strongest understanding. Context clues, secondary evidences, etc. Moving forward. Um, what about men who don't have long hair with them? Their hair doesn't make sujood with them. Their hair is short. Their hair is tied up and it is their hair is tied the hair is tied up and it isn't tied up. We feel that the prohibition is specific to those who intentionally go into Salah with the idea of tidying up and fastening it up so it won't make the sujood with them and they have a type of tekebbal with them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. We feel humbly. Move forward. Another very important concept is al-isbal is that a man may not have the ability to cut the pants or trim the pants. Maybe he has to roll them up. Um, but they were rolled up before the Salah and he comes into the Salah. Is it haram? Let the pants go, etc.? even though it's best for him to trim it and get it tailored. So therefore, that is a brief crash course meaning of the hadith and the desired intention of tucked up or rolled. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. We hope that's clear. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. In other words, I may work. I may have a really good job. I don't have to shave my beard. I don't have to sell pork, alcohol. But I have to have my pants low, for example. Or I'm a plumber or a construction worker. I work in the field. And there's snakes and insects and things that can attack me on my ankles. So I have to have my pants down. So I can't have my garment trimmed for one reason or another. So when I come into the masjid, I definitely want to roll them up when, I, when I'm finishing my salah, praying on the work site. So if that hadith was what they're saying it is, that would be a hardship upon that brother. And there'll be many other hardships as well. Um, this is a humble answer. But as you can see, Alhamdulillah has some, some good details. That you will not find, and Allah knows best. I'm not saying it's out of pride or arrogance. It's the truth. In most cases, you're not going to find those details in one book, let alone in English. Simplified. All right? So these are from the specifics and the unique traits with regards to this work and other works as well. And all praise is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, that one issue and that one hadith is nothing more than a sample of a hundred and a thousand other fiqh issues that are misunderstood, misrepresented. Uh, many brothers spread coming back from Medina or Egypt or Yemen, and they didn't have the proper in depth, yani, umk, the depth. They didn't have it themselves. The Sheikh may not have had it, or they, they didn't teach it, or they didn't learn it, or they didn't have the ability to learn it, or they didn't stay in Yemen or Egypt or Medina long enough to get it. Or they may suffice themselves with Sheikh Qutaymin, Albani, Bin Baz, that's it, Kalas. And they not just spread it to the people, which is a good thing, but they forced it upon the people. You got to do it. You can't do this. This is haram. If you pray like this and you remove Teddy, you're an innovator. And that, that caused confusion. And that is one of the mission statements that we have in the Naitala is to unearth these things and remove this confusion and rebuild and lay down the orthodox, purest, strongest, the purest form. Inshallah, Hadith Disciple, the purest form possible. Explain it and simplify it to the people 
in English. And Allah Azza wa Jal surely knows best and with him is all success. Right. Try to take a few questions by Allah's permission. The first question we'll take from YouTube. Um, and that's coming from Initials R from Springfield, Virginia. Assalamu alaikum mufti. Can one do tiyamum if it is extremely cold outside to do wudu? The water is only available outdoors from a garden hose. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa The brief answer is yes, you can. AP from Philly, PA. Do hadith scholars weaken a hadith based on apparent contradiction with established things in the religion? In general, yes, they do. That's not absolute. There are There is harmonizing, tawfiq, wal jama' of course, but in general, from the styles or from the turq of naqt is a ta'arud or mu'arada. There's no question about that in brief. Yes. And we've explained that. Um, tayyip. Next question says AP from uh, oh, tayyip, tayyip, tayyip. AR, Springfield, Virginia. We'll move on to another person's question, inshallah. Tayyip, la bas. In general, we have a little bit of time. Try to share as much as we can. AR from Springfield, Virginia. Sorry, Mufti. If I make wudu and put on my socks after, and then I make my wudu, then my wudu breaks, do I have to mess? Or if I take off my socks, do I have to make wudu again? It says, if I make wudu and put on my socks after, and then my wudu breaks, and I do mess, if I take off my socks, do I have to, if, if, you, if you take off your socks when your wudu is broken, then you, obviously your wudu is already broken, and you're not going to make mess again. You're only going to make the mess as long as the socks remain on your feet. All right? And Allah knows best. Uh, F.A. Michigan, USA. Did Imam know we say that shaving the beard is disliked, but that we keep five o'clock shadow? Many scholars um, held a view with regards to certain things from the beard. Trimming it, not letting it grow too long, so on and so forth. All right? And Noe and others. Did Noe say that it's permissible to shave it? I don't know about that. I know Ibn Hazm rahimahullah naqra ijma' al-ulama ala tahrim haqq liha is that it's consensus of the scholars that the beard is impermissible to be shaven. If you have a five o'clock shadow, it's not necessarily shaven. You still have hair on your face. Many scholars, if not most of the later scholars, they hold the view is that as long as you have some hair on your face, it's not you haven't shaved the cheeks, the chin, and the jawbone, then they say you're antamultahin. Yani khalas, you have a lihya. And you haven't made halq and you've implemented that. Of course, that that opinion is weak, clearly weak, as feeble. The Prophet never said, have hair on your face. The Prophet never said, don't take the beard all the way off. He never ever spoke like that. He said, let the beard hang, let it fall, let it drape. Curtains drape through gravity, they don't stop halfway. So that's a weak view, without a question, there's no doubt about that's weak. Regardless of who takes and holds that view. Did Noe say that you can shave it and it's only makro? I don't know about that. I, I'm not going to misquote a Noe on that. And if he did say it or he didn't, it means nothing. In light of the Quran and Hadith. And the understanding and practice of the early Salaf. Wallahu alam. Next question says. RB, Philadelphia, PA. Nice hoodie, Sheikh. My question is, what's the best place to study in the West? Jazakallah khairan for the compliment. Alhamdulillah. Imam Muslim Center. May Allah bless us and give us the success there. Alhamdulillah. All the brothers there, the imams there, the brothers who administer the place there, the sisters who run the place there. May Allah bless them and bless us. Alhamdulillah. Masjid that we tried to establish some years back for several reasons. Alhamdulillah. We've done many, many classes there. Uh, hopefully, we'll be back there soon enough. Bi'idnillahi ta'ala. Um, the best place to study in the West? I, I, that's a difficult question. I've never been to every place in the West. I haven't been to all 50 states, 52 states or territories. I've never been to, uh, you know, Alaska, Texas, Puerto Rico. I've never been to different parts, territories in other states of the United States. I don't know. I don't know. In general, you study with somebody that you trust. You study with someone that you respect. You study with someone that you feel is upon khair and can give you some khair. Wherever they may be, black, white, yellow, purple, or green. That's what I would say. Wallahu alam. And beware of, of course, the yeah, need people making claims about themselves and about others. Moving forward, why a Hyattsville, Maryland, is it permissible to wear a polo because of the characters? I don't think it's haram. The character is it 3D? Is it in depth? Is it clearly a man, eyes, neck, etc.? 
If it causes you doubt, stay away from it for sure. Stay away from it, inshallah ta'ala. It's the best thing to do. Inmate from Toronto, Canada. Should I still pray even though I commit many sins? I feel like I'm too bad to pray because I commit many sins. Not praying in itself is a sin. It's one of the greatest sins. And that's a trick of shaitan. And unfortunately, that's from the uh, negative effects of sins. It makes you feel far from Allah. And what's the point of praying? If I'm going to do the same sin again, what's the point? That's a trick. And if you don't pray, your deen will suffer even more. And, and help is sought from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always pray no matter what. Even if you feel like a hypocrite, you're going to go back to the same sin. Do not miss the five daily prayers. You may not make witr, tahajr, this sunnah, that sunnah. Don't miss the prayers and make jum'ah. You never know when Allah will guide you. And for you to die as a sinner with prayer, is a hundred times better than you dying without the prayer. And Allah knows best. That's in brief. L.A. from Texas, USA. I know that is not wearing head covering hijab is haram, but does it take me out of the fold of Islam? Many imams and scholars around me say that a major sin takes a person out of Islam. True. No, that's not true. A sister who goes outside with her hair uncovered, wearing skin-tight clothes or loose clothes, but she's not wearing a hijab, is still a Muslimah. She's still a believer. She's a sinful believer, but she's still a believer. The moment she says, I don't have to wear it, and there's no excuse for her to make a horrible statement like that, that's a different story. She may become a kafir. But she's a sinner. I know it's wrong. I'm going through something. Don't judge me. Only Allah can judge me. Still a Muslim. And those scholars who say otherwise are terribly mistaken. And Allah knows best. Sheikh, who from the moving forward? Uh, M.A., Florida, USA. I got into a street fight with a guy and I knocked him out and broke his jaw. Should I ask him for forgiveness? And should I pay for his broken jaw surgery? It depends why he got into a fight. You're defending yourself. He attacked you. It was an altercation which was unavoidable. Or you transgressed against him. If you transgress the boundaries, no doubt, make toba, apologize, compensate him. And if it was self-defense, then, hey, learn your lesson. Don't come near me again. You might get knocked out and your jaw broken. That's, that's his problem or her problem. <laughs> However, his jaw got broken. May Allah help us all. Tayyip. Um, next question says, uh, F.A. Michigan, you say, should I take knowledge from Mufti Abu Layth or is he misguided? Next question. Ahmed Tayyip, Philadelphia, PA. Is it permissible for a woman to give a man or boy shahada? For sure. As long as there's no khalwa, no fitna, nothing haram, let her allow him to enter into Islam. Sheikh Tayyip, moving forward. L.A., Texas, USA. How can I make wudu without... And next time, guys, inshallah, I'll put the city. Not just the state. City and state. Inshallah, ta'ala. Not just Texas, USA, but the actual city. Uh, how can I make wudu without it drying my face out? And it's haram to wash it more than three times during wudu. Make wudu. After you're done the whole wudu, dry yourself off. Exfoliate. Put on lotion. Coconut oil. Cocoa butter. Olive oil. Whatever you want to put. All right, on your skin to make it shine and be bright and etc. All right, your skin inshallah is not going to dry out. All right, if you do that, and if it did dry out, it's a sacrifice you make for Allah. All right, click clear on that inshallah ta'ala. Okay, last but not least is um, washing three more than three times. It should not be done unless it's a necessity, unless you got something on your skin that won't come off, something like that. Other than that, it should be strictly avoided. H A Birmingham UK Salam Mufti. Is my grandma and sister mahram or a non-mahram, which is the best way to pray with it? What do you consider your grandmother's sister? What is her name or her title to you? Is she considered your aunt? If she's your aunt, then she takes the ruling of aunts. And if she's other than that, she takes the ruling of other than that. What would you consider to be your grandmother's sister, your great aunt? Your great aunt, Hakada. Is your aunt or aunt a mahram for you? Can you give your aunt a hug? Can you be alone with her? Then if your grandmother's sister is the same, then it's the same. You understand how it works? And Allah knows best. Next question states. H A Birmingham UK. Move with my grandma. Uh, which is the best way to pray with it? You can go to our workshop on fasting and Ramadan, in which we explain the night prayer in some type of detail. And how the, the different styles of making witr. In brief, before you sleep, or even after Salat al-Isha, you make one raka'ah. 
it's three raka'ah, five raka'ah, seven raka'ah, nine raka'ah. And it's best, inshallah, to slam out after the second, then make the last one, which will be the odd. And if you only did one raka'ah, you're going to slam out after that, or half of that. Wallahu alam. Say it. Fikum barakallah, mahmoji, haikallah. F.A. Michigan, USA. If I follow the opinion that shaving part of the head is only disliked, just like the four medhabs, and not haram, am I a sinner? If that's what you honestly believe, based off of following those scholars, that's best. If you're uneducated, you don't know specifically yourself, you take the ruling from those scholars, not just because you want to, but that's what you feel is right, that's best, inshallah. And Allah knows best. So let's move forward to Facebook. Sorry, we give salam to everybody as well. Alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Is it permissible? We mentioned that the other day about breeding dogs and puppies. May Allah bless you all. Good evening to each and every one of you. All of you. Where can I get that hoodie? Uh, I got it as a gift. Inshallah, maybe you can go on the website or go to the masjid and they have them for sale. Um, if I'm not mistaken. Moving forward. All right. Is following the mezhab is not following is following the mezhab not following the previous predecessors? Not necessarily. Madhab is pretending to fiqh. It doesn't mean you have to be a deviant in aqidah, bad aqidah, whooped aqidah. Let alone the fact that the, those imams are technically from the salaf, the earlier generations. Now what do you mean by following a madhab? I want to follow the madhab no matter what. No matter what makes sense to me. No matter what I feel in my heart. No matter what's clear to me. That's one thing. Versus I'm an uneducated Muslim. I know the basics of my religion. I go to work. I work 16 hours a day, 14 hours a day. Come home, go play with my little kids. I let my sons, my daughters jump on my back, give me a back massage. I eat my dinner and I go to sleep. I'm not a scholar. I'm not involved in scholastics. Follow what, you, what you've been taught. Follow what you've learned. And that's, inshallah, enough for you. The moment something doesn't feel right, the moment something pops up, you ask those who have knowledge in your vicinity. Whether they're Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hamali, Zahiri, Zaidi, Hadawi, etc. You ask those who know in your vicinity, regardless of their orientation. Clear, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, Tayyip, IMFC, Khairan. JT, Baltimore, Maryland, how to perform sajda, Sahih, behind Imam, or is that okay to do? Sajda, Sahu. Follow the Imam. If the Imam made a mistake, you follow him in that. If you made you forgot something behind the Imam, don't worry about it. As long as you were behind him, it's you're exempt from it. It doesn't pertain to you anymore. MashaAllah, brother coming from Haiti. May Allah bless you. Help how all the Muslims, God all the Muslims keep them firm in Haiti. I mean. Hopefully we'll visit Haiti one day, inshallah. That's our destiny. Assalamu alaikum, Mufti Munir. AH from Long Island, New York. When the Imam is reciting Isha or Fajr, should I remain silent? A little confused. We've explained that issue in detail. And to keep things simple and easy, I will tell you, if the Imam is reciting an Isha aloud, keep silent. First Raka of Isha, first Raka of Maghrib, second Raka of Isha, second Raka of Maghrib, just listen to the Quran. Third, fourth raka, different story. And Allah surely knows best. Moving forward to Instagram. Let's see. May Allah bless you, brothers and sisters, as well. And reward you for your patience. Assalamu alaikum. Please remove the title of Mufti before your name as it is misleading. Jazakallah khairan. Wa alaikum as salam wa May Allah bless you. Let's see if we got any questions here.
question it says let's see I'm sorry this phone is acting up how to pay for university with student loans is the only option from Toronto do you have to go to the university that's number one secondly ask a lot to make it easy for you to give you a way out somehow if you have to go to the university and that's the only way to pay for it then you're stuck between a rock and a hard place ask a lot to forgive you I mean, AH from Malika, Assalamu alaikum, Mufti. I hope you're well. Do you follow the Mutaqaddimun in Hadith? And would you recommend the text Al Muqaddimah of Imam Al Muqida by Imam Al Zahabi? Tight question coming from London. Zakallahu Khairan, Alaikum Salam, Tawabi Katsu. There lies no doubt. Following the earliest generations in everything is that which is best in hadith and fiqh and tawheed and anything. There lies no doubt about that. That's the best thing to do. And who would know Ibn al Hadith more than the Imams who lived it? Or who would know was Shad or Ma'lul or Munkar or Muttarib? more than the ones who established and laid down those foundations. 